Oh, I can this. Holy moly. <laughs> I even look at this thing. <laughs> Oh, these nights are, these are nice days. Okay. Okay, let's start the uh, Conservation Commission meeting for November 16, 2016. Um, we're recording uh, the meeting, so, and if anybody else is recording, please let us know. And if you could silence your cell phones, that would be appreciated. Okay, first off is the public meeting. Uh, does anybody have any comments for items that are not being heard tonight? Okay, seeing not, going to the public hearing, notices of intent which we have quite a few continuances. Um, Edwin Snyder, Revocable Trust, 2 Brock's Court, is continued till the 30th. Sunset House, LLC, 15 Hollowell Lane, is continued to the 30th. Uh, Ray's, 19 East Creek Road, as I well. Think, yeah, I think Paul wants it. Oh, you want me to comment? Yeah, I'm going to actually submit a withdrawal request for that. Oh. Well. You guys just took everyone's pleasure, I'm sure. So. Okay. You guys just need to Except for the trial. So if you want to finish the continuous. Yeah, let me just finish because I. Yep. Okay. And then uh, just someone needs to make a motion to accept the withdrawal of that application. Okay, so we're also um, continuing Burke, 37 Gardner Road, till the 30th as well. And Hallover LLC, 165 Wall Winnet Road, is continued till the 30th. And I think I got them all. Okay. So, good. Uh -huh. so if anyone's here for any of that, those, and would like to make some comment about them is not going to be able to make it for the 30th. Um, if not, you can also uh, send uh, written comments to the office and they'll be in our packets next time around. So we're going to go with, um, start with um, 19, raise 19 East Creek Road and they're asking for a withdrawal. Would someone like to make a motion to accept that withdrawal? Motion to accept the withdrawal. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. That's right, withdrawn. So 62 Wall Street, LLC, 62 Wall Street. <laughs> no, I ain't gonna file them. No, no, we did that. We tried. For the record, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors representing the applicant uh, Nantucket 62 Wall Street LLC. Uh, this is a developed piece of property at 62 Wall Street in which the resource area is strictly a land subject to coastal storm flowage. It's a uh, fully developed lot in which we are proposing to put a uh, freestanding garage on the northern side in the area where the existing shell driveway is. We're looking to uh, rework and expand the existing shell driveway. And then in the back section of the lot on an existing uh, raised patio that exists, they're looking to put a, a spar, a raised spar on the back side um, on the elevated existing patio. Uh, those items are all shown in red on the particular plan. The proposed garage, 396 square feet on the northerly side, the driveway, and then the spa remained in the back side of the parcel. Um, the garage will be a um, slab foundation with a um, flood vents for uh, pass through for um, the flood waters in the storm forward. So it's not an infill or not an enclosed um, type of foundation system. Um, this is a new order, whereas the uh, existing order of conditions was added on and a certificate of compliance was issued for the work that presently exists on the site. So it is a, a new order. Uh, we do not have a DEP file number, so I will be asking for a continuance. And we are also outside of any mapped NHESP plan, so the one item that we have lacking at this point is the uh, DEP file number. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may, may have. I, I actually will bring up one other point. Uh, this portion of this work does occur in that, that section of what you see as Vic Street on the plan is actually being di disposed of under the yard sale program. So where it shows Dick Street is actually becoming part of this of this particular piece of property. Mm -hmm. It's an undeveloped just piece of Dick's that did at one point run to the south um, but is no longer is no longer there. Mm -hmm. Well, 
direct bearing, but the walking and bicycle easement, does that go through or yeah. does it stop? It's 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 there. I don't think it's an active easement because right. it's it's actually been completely developed. Gotcha. And it does not go through that ex existing okay. section of Dick Street. Hmm. I think it's it's there by plan only. I don't think there's actually a document that ever created it. I think okay. it was an idea that somebody had at one point right. uh, that never never um, yeah. ended up. It's registered land, so it does show up on the rent on the land plan. Well, typically, too, within the the yard sale program, when the town disposes of that, a lot of the yard sale pieces. If it's a public access piece, we'll maintain an easement for public access through portions of it, so they don't, you know, cut up those strike this. Gotcha. Yeah. What sort of stormwater management is on the site or proposed? Uh, there is currently the the roof drains are all, I believe, sub subsurface. Though they're all tied mm -hmm. into the into a um, into a subsurface shallow type of system, um, and that's. We'd probably do a similar thing with the garage in this situation here, but other than that, there is um, no other um, no other infiltration system other than the roof. The majority of it, the, the development on the site is the, is the building itself, mm -hmm. and that is tied to a roof drain system. Um, but that would that would be it. You think you're going to be needing any dewatering? Um, I actually don't think we did for the. Uh, you may need for the, the the garage itself. It's it's a slab, but yeah. you're going to have four foot. You're going to have to have at least cross wall. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there'll be a, a significant amount for the 396 foot area that they have right there. And plus, they're going to be disturbing the area where the, dura, the driveway is anyway. So there's enough area over there to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. There is no drainage, I believe, in this section of Wall Street. There is sewer, but there is no. I don't think there's any catch basins out there. So where would the roof drains go? Then? Just it's it's an infiltration system. It's a shallow, okay. it, yeah, shallow system. So that would be fine to condition the garage. That the garage problem. would be tied to a okay. subsurface system. Would yeah. be no problem at all. Any other questions? Questions from the public? Okay. So you're not here. No. Okay. So you'd like to continue for another? Yes. Two weeks. Okay. Yes. I just checked just in case, but. Nah, it didn't come in. Not just this one, there's going to be a bunch of this group that could be Yes, that's what we think the system that will outfall into the town of Nantucket um, stormwater drainage system that runs through their um, treatment and best management practice system near Children's Beach and outfalls at the uh, Great, Great Harbor Yacht, or, uh, sorry, Nantucket Yacht Club um, property. So there will be no um, site runoff Offsite runoff generated by the um, impervious surface of the roof system. There already exists a um, <coughs> subsurface drainage infiltration system that picks up the runoff from the, um, the tennis courts. 
which is here, the pitch is very slightly toward the back of the building. This system will be, be maintained. There's three outlets in a um, trench drain in between the, the uh, inlet locations for the um, transport. So site drainage won't be changed. The characteristics won't be changed. In fact, we'll probably be picking up more, um, intercepting more <coughs> what is now running off the site, uh, just overland, and um, uh, picking up more of that because the roof system is larger, and that is all going to be directed to the town drainage system. And it, this is a direct discharge to harbor drainage system? Uh, it's a treated discharge system uh, within the um, <coughs> the notice and ten application. Um, Leo, uh, as Dorian, who put this together, included all the design elements of the uh, town discharge system, which was approved by the DEP. Is that that's that? It's down at Children's Base, right in the bulk, like yeah. the head of the bulk. What kind of foundation is this going to have? Um, it's, I'm guessing it's going to be, um, I believe it's a put into the stem wall and um, not a pile foundation. It would be you know, smart vents so that mm -hmm. storm water flow be beneath the building. Of course, the, the structure is going to have to be elevated higher than the one that's there now to comply with the zoning and humor requirements. Larger is the new structure? Um, here, I'll give you a visual. I thought that question might come up. It's easily twice as big. So, uh, the dark shade indicates something. That's a really broad one. And, um, the dark shade indicates the existing footprint, and this around here is the proposed footprint. So it's, it's easily twice as big. Yeah, a little more. Yeah. Right. And we would have, it's definitely a lot more water going to the town system. Yes. So, Jeff, one thing that's been coming up in a lot of these meetings is, you know, the amount of building density we're seeing in these areas downtown, uh, coastal storm flowage areas, and the um, sort of loss of that resource. And especially with a commercial building, I'm not sure, Jeff, maybe you can speak to this, but uh, in a commercial building, the foundations aren't subject to the same regulations. In other words, you could potentially have a full foundation right without the storm vents. Am I right about that? No. It has to have the storm vents. No, you, okay. you can't build a, you can't build that kind of what is What is the commercial? There was something yeah, that came up. There was a commercial. It's a. Is it a storm of, water thing? It's or? part of the building code. Yeah, itself. But what's the difference between a commercial structure and a residential structure as far as coastal storm flush? Because this came up on, I think I'm going to forget somebody's Was it Candle Street or something? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And there's a difference. There was For a the diff building code, there is a difference. They, they can look at them differently, and I am no expert on the building code. I will not pretend to be that. We have too, an expert. I'm not aware of any pass that no? they get on um, you know, FEMA construction compliance. Or Matt, do you have any? Any intelligence on that? There was something that came up recently that I'm remembering. And well, the Heron Theater has a full basement. Yeah, right yeah. Right the street. Right. Yeah. I know for the plan. Oh no, go for ahead, you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know that the planning board um, what it does require, and Arthur can help me out with this one, that um, a certain percentage, up towards 90, 95 percent of all storm water, has to be um, discharged and handled on site. But I think that might be for an MCP. It's something for that. Or a commercial use, I think it was, and that yeah. maybe that's what you're talking about. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, maybe, well, how does White Heron get a full basement if you have to have? There is a thing we actually, the most recent one we saw was the, the project we looked at for the brass lantern end, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of right out the back, this yeah. one too. Right. And the building code is different. Our performance standards don't distinguish between commercial and residential. Yeah. So if we feel that there's a great loss to 
the flood storage capacity, then that's something that you can certainly condition to meet the performance standard. If they are providing a foundation system that has, you know, it typically we consider foundations with vents or piling foundations or things to be compliant to the standard because you're not losing the flood storage capacity. Right, and if this was a totally fully enclosed foundation such as, you know, like uh, White Heron is, then I would think in theory you'd lose that whole stor storage potential, yes? Yes. But if this has got vents, it should allow... Yeah, as long as it, I suppose that's a, <laughs> that's a long way around the question, but do we know I, that? I think, sure? I think the way to deal with that would simply be to include in the order of condition something that requires some sort of venting within the foundation system. And then if, right. if they came back with a design that said, well, that doesn't work, we're going to pursue this path, they'd have to come back and amend or modify the permit. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we are definitely looking <coughs> to do it. And we've thought the plans all along were developed on the basis that we would allow for the flow and deal with it. So yeah. So even with the new FEMA, I guess I, so since FEMA has revised, um, it's, I, I want to say regulations, but I guess it's no. not a regulation, isn't it? It's advisory rather than a, a regulatory requirement. The, there was new mapping issues mm -hmm. back in 2014 mm -hmm. right. that right. changed the base flood elevations in right. certain areas. Right. And pushes but the building up higher than the, the first floor of the building higher than it otherwise would But I assume that was a legal requirement, and you're saying that, in fact, from what Ben is saying, that it's only advisory. Mm -hmm. No, it's in the it's codes not, now. No, it's it's legal. Legal. But pre existing yeah. houses, insurance yeah. companies are making it yeah. worth their while. It's incorporated in the zoning code. <laughs> yes. Yeah. made yeah. Nantucket adapt right into okay. the zoning code. Right. Okay. So okay. that would include then the pass throughs would be a zoning requirement. Because I'm still puzzled by what Ben is saying and what? how the White Heron got through. Well, we, well, we don't know. I, I don't know. No. I wasn't involved in that no, project. No. We don't know whether they're in a maybe the flood zone stops before the White Heron um, location. Right, that's what I would think. Could, but yeah. it doesn't really affect, well I'm just doesn't just really affect this. Yeah. I can oh. just fall down. Go ahead. Just different classes of construction that have to do with the building code, mm -hmm. international building code, the local building code. The White Heron's a commercial building with no housing. You know, there's no, nobody lives in the lower space. So that's a, that's a, it's a new construction. It's an allowed use for the commercial, for the basement because there's no living space down below. Perhaps Lanton was a different situation because that was a grandfathered use in the flood zone. That building had, it was a historical building with an addition so that's a, a different use. Mm -hmm. So this one, I don't know what this proposal is, but if this proposal is new housing, then that would be, no, it's the housing component on the, that triggers the, whether you can or can't have the basement in the commercial mm -hmm. structure. And then when you go back to like um, Easy Street, and I think um, John Ray's building over there, mm -hmm. that's a commercial building that the floor is below the flood zone, but you can do flood protection on the doorways, windows, again, because it's a strictly commercial use with no housing. It's the housing okay. that, that, triggers it. that triggers the basement component, whether you could or you couldn't enter the way. Okay. Yeah. So that's a dormitory. I mean, they, I'm, I'm assuming they don't have a basement with, full, with rooms in the basement. So that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, because there's no, no, there is no basement. There is no basement. So that's why yeah. that situation, gotcha. you know. Okay, thanks. So thanks. I think it's, it's strictly to the building code and what the use is, whether there's living space, non living space. So what is the surface where this building is going? I know there's a lot of concrete back there. Is this mostly in the parking lot, or is there, are they covering more open ground? It's on grass. There's, there's some open ground there. There's some lawn there in the present mm -hmm. time. Um, it's all kind of cut off. There. There's, a, there's a parking area uh, in there, uh, uh, but some grass around there. It's a little park dirt parking lot and just yeah. a little yeah. patch also of grass. It's not yeah. 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 And do you have this, the actual square footage increase? I'm still interested in the stormwater, even though it's going to a treated town drain, that's a, a lot more 
stormwater to the system that would have been naturally infiltrating? Well, to some degree, it would have been naturally <coughs> infiltrating or running off the ground surface. I mean, I look at the runoff from a roof as being a more desirable contribution to the stormwater system than runoff from a wall. What kind of shingles is it? Again, the resource area in question, because we get mired in this all the time, the resource area in question is land subject to coastal storm right. mm -hmm. Is all of these things for storm and dealing with storm water, while required because this is a commercial application, is how changing the land use impacts the land's ability to store and withstand flooding. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to stay within our purview. I mean, I know there are things that we'd like to reach into that are related, but we can't condition or permit things that aren't within the resource area. In this, in this case, if it's, I mean, we're putting signs on the storm drains outside this building that say direct discharge to harbor. So in this case, if it's tying into a direct discharge, isn't that a resource area that we need to look at in relation to this it project? Is, but we have to condition to that resource area. And it's kind of an interesting question when you think about where things discharge and the impacts to that resource area and how that works. And I guess the way that we the way the commission has rationalized things like this before and doesn't come up a lot is the system that was in place and designed to be there was designed and permitted in compliance with the wetlands protection Act required Conservation Commission permitting. If you're using that system, the theory before has been that it meets the performance standards that it was designed and built to meet. So I have a question because I think that's a really good point. And it would appear to be a really massive building by Nantucket standards. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to see the performance calculations that show that, in fact, um, it meets our condition. Because when I look at this right here, it seems that I don't see how in a storm surge that these could possibly absorb all the water going through. And um, I would have thought that there would be a greatly increased velocity going around either side. And so um, please tell me that I'm mistaken. Well, the, the requirement is for flood vent openings for one square inch for every one square foot of footprint of the structure. The building department will monitor and require an elevation certificate at the end of the construction. And in, on that elevation certificate, we have to note um, whether that formula, one square inch per square foot of footprint, is, is satisfied. That, that's a FEMA requirement. The vents are, the, the standard smart vent brand vents are, um, take care of 200 square inches per vent. So it's, it's a simple calculation to um, you know, require the proper number of vents for a, for a building. Well, I'm sorry you're having to explain this to me. No, 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 no it's <laughs> it's why, why would you think about it on <laughs> any other yeah. occasion? Well, that's <coughs> interesting. You know, um, thank you for answering my concerns. Of course. Other questions? Questions from the public? Mr. Chairman, Cormac Collier, Nantucket Land Council. Um, just a little bit of the recent history in terms of the Land Council and the Department of Natural Resources and our preliminary efforts for addressing the stormwater um, problem in the downtown area. Um, I've been talking with Jeff about this in terms of it's the one area that really has left to be addressed dealing with the septic, we're dealing with the fertilizer, we're partially dealing with some stormwater issues from Concert Springs um, and a couple of the other outfalls, but we really have to relook at that. Children's Beach outfall, so um, the Land Council is going to initiate some water quality um, investigations of all the outfalls and then also um, look at existing regulations um, for stormwater runoff from roofs, from impervious surfaces, and see how we can improve that and also how we can utilize existing regulations, such as your regulations, to improve um, uh, that as well. The system down at Children's Beach, um, really its main 
purpose is to remove TSS, total suspended, suspended solid. It doesn't do anything for nitrogen, as far as I can tell, um, reviewing that. Our main concern with the health of the harbor, as you know, is nitrogen. Um, atmospheric deposition is the largest contributor to the harbor um, and the water quality in the harbor. Most, it's because of the size of the water sheet, but also because of the imperfect surface runoff as well that's going there. There is some amount of, if you, we can do this one, if you look at the GIS, everything here is grass. And I hear Jeff, what he's saying in terms of there's some runoff from the grass into the road. But I, I'm, our business is just right up there, and I walk there all the time, including in rains, and it infiltrates right into the grass. So there is some retention of that nitrogen coming through the rainwater into the grass, into the soil biota, and the vegetation. Granted, it's minute, I, I understand, but with stormwater, um, it's a cumulative impact. So what they have right now is essentially um, rainwater with nitrogen entering um, the stormwater system, which is going to be a directed discharge, unfortunately, into the harbor, whereas um, that's their proposal, whereas now you do have some retention of nitrogen. I understand also where what Jeff Carlson is saying in terms of where your regulations point you to for coastal storm flowage. I'm not that uh, versed in them anymore, so I wish, I hope, you could go somewhere with this um, in terms of uh, requiring some retention on site. And then for Arthur, um, Knowing many of the members at the Yacht Club, including many that Maybe a few are that are on my board, perhaps they'd be interested in this. Easily enough room here to do some bioretention, um, essentially doing a swale with vegetation. It would still be connected to the stormwater system, but your first flush would be handled in here. Um, there's possibilities for doing that, and these are some of the things that Jeff and I have talked about in terms of doing these innovative alternative best management practices for stormwater in the downtown area. That's something that the Yacht Club, I think, could buy into if the cost is right um, in terms of being a good neighbor and good um, uh, respectful uh, entity for the harbor watershed. So whether, uh, what I'm getting at, Mr. Chairman, is it's not taking up too much of your time. If you guys can't do it through your regulations, mm -hmm. I hope you can insist that there's bioretention. If not, I'd love for you guys to consider that because there's definitely some possibility that just sending it to that children's beach system unfortunately isn't doing anything with the nitrogen. So I have a specific question for you. So how much nitrogen do you think in an average year is actually going to run off that roof into the harbor? Because I'd like a specific... Uh, they could easily do that. They, they, they take... Uh, we, we have a nitrogen atmospheric deposition sampling station um, that we have for the island now. The Land Council does. It's part of the, the national network. They could take those average numbers, or they could just take the average numbers which people use, Brian Howes uses for the estuaries report from the sampling station in Cape Cod. They could use that, they do the square footage calculation, they could easily get an average of what, how much nitrogen would now be entering the system versus how much would be, on average, infiltrated with a normal grass bed and, and however organic, much organic matter of that soil that's underneath. So they can do, a, they can easily do a pre and post. And again, their numbers are probably going to say, look, it's not that significant. But again, it's a cumulative thing. And if we do this piecemeal, I think we can deal with some of these um, issues uh, leading up. I'm sorry to take up too much time, but we're really sort of on this. And I think it's a really, really important sort of issue. Um, a lot of these outfalls, they're not going to have the room to do bioretention um, when we look at them in individually. They're just not going to have the room. So what we need is the upgradient areas to be maximized for, for bioretention. The, the issue I see with some of that is um, it's in a certain sense it's a question of timing. Nitrogen that infiltrates into groundwater, some of it will stick around, but it, since it is a cumulative process and every time it rains, more nitrogen goes down there gets into groundwater, it's just like a septic system. Sooner or later, it runs off into a pond or into the harbor or into the ocean. And bioretention may accumulate it in plants, but and some of it will get denitrified under certain circumstances. But they're kind of... I mean, I did, I, just to jump in, I hear what Ernie's saying, but the, the science, the data that they have on, the, on the, the water coming in through the downspouts goes through 
through the bioretention area and then goes out, it's it's, it's definitely, it's lower, definitely yeah. lower. Yeah. He's got a point though that sometimes some of it's coming down and still getting into your groundwater. But it's as a few, as a sort of totality, it's definitely lower. But isn't that's it minuscule compared to what's actually running off from all the fertilizer that's being used that drains into the harbor? Um, I would probably say. Uh, and for this project itself, yes. But, but again, we're trying to tackle it. I understand it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a different form of nitrogen. So you have readily leachable nitrates that are getting put down, and then you have more ammonia based nitrogen, which is what would initially be going into these systems, most likely. So it is a little bit different. And it certainly is significant when we're talking about the square footage from a commercial building being added to a public space. You know, we need to be making that connection. No, I, I'm not disputing that. I just would like some hard numbers, in a, in a sense. Um, well, the end does not um, seem reasonable not. to if we're imposing a design criteria on mm -hmm. applicants, and we want to know really what we're talking about. It's like what Cormac said, Ian. If you look at the harbor and the harbor watershed, then according to studies that have been done, kind of modeling mostly probably, the largest annual source of nitrogen to the harbor is simply atmospheric deposition. I mean, from you know burning of fossil fuels and all kinds of forms, maybe some volatilization of agricultural nitrogen, or that might not be as important on the east as it is in the Midwest, for example. But it's just because there's such a huge area, even though it's a tiny amount per given, like a lawn, it's it's very small compared to, a, say, an annual dose of fertilizer. But because it's such a huge area of the harbor and stuff, then that it adds up to a big number. So, um, and in a certain sense, you know, grass, if, if you got nitrogen de deposited on the grass, it's being fertilized at the grass you know, lawns will use that fertilizer, and that could be, you know, that mitigates it in itself, or the vegetation. That's why we, you know, want vegetation in general instead of, you know, impervious surface where it just immediately runs off. I mean, uh, I certainly have no, no argument with you on it, or any of my fellow commissioners. It's just that, um, I don't know, without the math, I, I feel... I can send you some nitrogen cycle. Well, that would be great. So, are, are we I'm asking Mr. Chairman that they consider this in the design? Well, it looks like they're already have. Well, I mean, I respect their drawing. They've got a couple of trees on that side of the building, and it seems like they're, they're thinking, not thinking towards. Although I know it's not probably the final set of plans, but the green space between there and the sidewalk. So I don't. I would see what see. What Gray water. Well, how big of a retention system would you need for a building of this size? I mean, right. you're in, exactly. I mean, you don't have a lot of. There's not a lot of depth before you hit. Right. No, so it's very shallow. Mm -hmm. It's very shallow right here. You really don't so have a lot of options. If you look at the stuff, there are a lot of options. People just need to be innovative. Mm -hmm. um, Philadelphia makes every commercial building infiltrate the first inch per hour of rainwater on site, or they get taxed mm -hmm. to the high heavens. So there are plenty of ways to infiltrate on site. People just need to make their buildings a little smaller and think about the green space. Yep. And that's not what we're seeing. Um, but certainly, I think they could do better with the stormwater management here. Um, and outgoing direct to the harbor is not a good idea. Does the uh, tennis courts take, does the clay pretty impervious on the tennis court? It's a hard true surface. Yeah. It is a lot of surface. It, it, it must take some. It absorbs. Are, the the that is yeah. infiltrated. That's a large infiltrator. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me see. Are there uh, if I may throw in, because it, it's something that I've been looking at a lot mm -hmm. outside of the commission for these areas, and one of the real difficulties with this area specifically and looking at bioretention, which I think is always the, the best choice when possible, is groundwater here, and I think from going up and down the street and looking at it, in a lot of these spots, groundwater is within 18 inches to 2 feet of the surface, and you lose a lot of infiltration right. ability because you just don't have the vertical space to do it. Storage. Um, 
typically the way around that is you create a vertical separation by mm -hmm. mounds and swales and things that are there. The question that we run into, and, and it's kind of the question that we need to resolve is, when you put a mound there and you're taking away from your ability to retain floodwaters, and you're changing the flood storage capacity of the lot, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and that's, it, it, it's the catch of this site. Yeah. I mean, if you built an eight foot high mound, total exaggeration, but if you built the eight foot high mound that's there so you could infiltrate water in, that's great, but the volume of that mound is now lost to the flood zone, which is the resource area that we're trying to protect. So it's, it's similar to, it's a discussion that I've been having with the land bank for the Arno site, is mm -hmm. how to deal with water on that site that flows right into the harbor because the land goes that way and talking about swales and depressions to deal with storm water mm -hmm. it's kind of the unresolvable question for us is we would love to put mounds and create these spots to deal with it but now you've lost you know a thousand cubic yards of storage space in the flood zone that we'd either have to waive the requirement to or find some way around it. I mean it's it's kind of the catch. I mean, does a subsurface tank that provides some sort of treatment, is that a choice mm -hmm. before it gets pumped in? Maybe, but I mean, it's it's a question that we, it's bigger than this site here to deal with for the downtown area, but it's you know, kind of a sample of what Cormac and I have been talking about yeah. quite a bit, is how do we find ways to encourage people to do it that still meets regulatory standards? So you can prevent the flowing of nutrients into the harbor, but still meet the questions that are there. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a tangled web. <laughs> and if we have a, we put a, a bioretention swell in here and vegetate it, what are we going to put in for vegetation if it's going to be getting fresh water off the roof, and then we have a, a flood and we get it inundated with ocean water? So frag we're going to go. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I can think of one thing, Craig, and I would not want to propose that. Actually, um, <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. Live television. It's done. <laughs> Maybe certain. Um, I know where to find some. Some grasses <laughs> might work. Some I think we have opposition. Spartina already. might work. <laughs> um, I, I definitely, Cormac, probably, I definitely hear what. Uh, as we remember, the whole area was flooded all the way up to yeah. here, and there's plenty of plants that yeah. have still survived after that flood. Maybe on a more repetitive process, we should be concerned about, but you can definitely do a freshwater bioretention as well and have, have the plants survive. So um, getting towards just sort of exactly what we're talking about here, we don't have any data on the groundwater and where the groundwater <laughs> is. So mm -hmm. if you are interested, perhaps we hold it over, get some data on where the groundwater is, dig a pit, see where the model is. And then if they can't do it, if the next step is if you really want to do it, you do what Jeff just said as a possibility, an underground tank to, that might do some bioretention. In my limited research, there's plus and minuses of that because there's not really anything to eat it up. Wow. So mm -hmm. you're yeah, it's just system. System. So right. um, you're denitrifying septic systems and that's supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's a way to go to sort of move this along if you're, if you're interested. Because uh, well, and then my, my one point was, I've never seen somebody wanting directly to tie in this amount for impervious surface into the stormwater system. So this is this is somewhat new for you guys. And if this is going to be a standard, per perhaps it takes a it, it warrants a little bit of a stronger look. Okay. Well, well, the, I know the town is not that. town's not big on having roof runoff go in the storm mm -hmm. drains. Yeah, normally the yeah, mm -hmm. so I don't think that's going to... Can I just say something? I, when I submitted the notice of intent, we did submit stormwater management program. I haven't heard back from the state. Mm -hmm. comments on it. Leo, would you introduce yourself, please? Oh, oh yeah, that sorry. Uh, for the record, Leo Azadorian of Blackland Associates. Apologize for being late. I was off island. That uh, I submitted along with it all the plans that were done by APOM with the EMP structures that were in place that actually outlet on Harper property itself. Uh, you know, we looked at those structures. They remove about 8% of the total suspended solids. And uh, I, I guess what I missed here was you were concerned about nitrates that were in the rainwater that eventually will end up in the harbor period. Uh, seems to be the seems main to be concern. The, yeah. the catch basins out, out there safe. that collect the rainwater right now and end up in those BMP structures anyways. Mm -hmm. So we're just picking it up and keeping it from going into the street and going into that 24-inch line. So I, I 
I really don't see the concern. I mean, is, is it the rainwater quality that's really the issue here more than anything else? I mean, both, because total suspended solids isn't going to deal with nitrogen and chemicals. It's going to deal with turbidity and stopping sedimentation in the harbor. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to stop runoff from asphalt roof shingles and nitrogen deposition that way. It's also, a, I'm just wondering what the stormwater calculation is for the roof at an inch per hour. How much are you actually dumping out into the harbor? We, we did some analysis and it was given to uh, Ed Pesci because there was a special permit application with this as well. And uh, that was raised at the, uh, at the coordinated review which Jeff was at. And, and so we did supply some initial analyses. He's going to come back with a, his report and his review. And, and my email to him was just to let us know what additional information we need at that point in time. I mean, you could even have yeah. above ground stormwater planters on the sides of the tennis court, yeah. you know, to infiltrate some of this water. So there's there's definitely things you could do. There's a lot of area here. Yeah. Switch over to grass courts and compete with Wimbledon. Song roof. <laughs> well, green roof. Oh, lovely. A green roof right, would be roof. perfect if yeah. we had that. Green roofs are great. great you infiltrate great. the water, and you're lot. taking the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. You're actually cooling your building. You're mitigating temperature changes. But your your point, Cormac, you're really concerned with rainwater quality, and this is one way to uh, yeah. mitigate atmosphere. Okay, well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, finally, one final point, Mr. Chairman, and this is no fault of the applicant whatsoever, but they did mention that um, they're trying to get information from the town on, on the op the operation and man management plan conditions as part of that children's beach, and the town. They weren't successful in getting that town information. I'm very biased with the DPW, but in terms of the management of that children's beach system and how much it's been cleaned out, I think that's definitely uh, an important information piece of information you guys should, should get because if you permit it, it's just assuming mm -hmm. that the O&M for that children's beach system is actually being adhered to, and I, I would have some doubts. I mean, some information here. Um, another quick question. Are we doing a gra any grade change on this uh, property? What's left of it? No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the public? Okay. Do we want, are we looking for anything? Does anybody have any, any more information here you would like? Where the groundwater is potentially. Um, can I just ask you guys? Is is where's the where's the property line? In other words, if, if there was a potential for some, does the property line run through here? Well, because of the bylaw, we would allow 18 persons per lot. So the new lot line is like this, and it goes through the building. Right here. So <laughs> it's actually a building that is bisected by the property. So in other words, That's this great. lot, right? And this, this is all one lot, and this is the second. So assuming that this is grass, I mean, does this does that open up potential to do no, something this is in here? Yeah, it's all hard through, right? So how far, is, right? How far do you, right? How far do you have to go past? What do you need for a tennis court? Sixty some feet, right? Yeah, I mean the fence is in place to be compliant. Okay, there it is. Right. Okay, right. gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. There really, really so there really isn't much. There's no there's no room to do anything in here, even no. though it's on this. This is on yeah. this property, right? Are you thinking like infiltrators? Well, uh, yeah, I was thinking if there's the any. Clay. It looks like there's a bunch of room, but if you need, I mean, you could do infiltrators. You already have a row of them, right? I mean, it seems like you could do some sort of subsurface yeah. infiltrators under here and still, still, still yeah. have. These these are catch-alls, and these are individual each pits according to the uh, code itself, which they maintain every day because they do fill up the courts as you I'm see sure. the grades yeah. slope this way, and it picks well, up all the hard true that washes in, and they're right. constantly cleaning. Them. Right, right. But those. Four, excuse me, three basins are all uh, individual pits and infiltration pits. Okay, so there's. Has this been approved by the HDC? It's in the process. Uh, for the HDC now, some changes have been made in the design, but not, but nothing in the footprint. I 
before the planning board at the December meeting, they have uh, they uh, uh, give it for the judge with being a uh, uh, what's called neighborhood employee housing, and in connection with that, uh, uh, you know, it actually uh, will be doing the uh, review of the drainage from that standpoint. Okay. All right. So, what are we asking these guys to do? Well, I'm, I'm curious, I'd be curious. I mean, if they're interested in some bio infiltrator, but not a mound system, but obviously landscaping as opposed to brick walkways and you know hard surfaces, would there be an interest in that on the part of the yacht club to take advantage of any potential space? You know, I guess the question is uh, how much space we have to work with, and whether it was whether it's whether it really is going to be worthwhile. In terms of Certainly, between now and the next meeting, uh, Leo can take a look at that. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at it. The, the only really only area on the lot, uh, because of the tennis yeah. activity here, is this, this area Just right here. Yeah. Before you came in, that's what we pointed out. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the way to, to ask that question to kind of stay within our purview is we'd like some more details on all for <laughs> landscaping that's going around with the structure and what oh, yeah. management activities are going to be taking place in those areas. Yeah. And you would strongly encourage them to look at those areas as possible areas to retain stormwater before it enters the system. God, the I couldn't have said it better myself. With mushroom farm, <laughs> Sorry, under the front porch. Take away some of the mushroom farm. Some grow lights in the front Okay, and I, yeah. I guess yeah. depth. could grow that, yeah, there you go. If we get an idea, I guess depth to groundwater <laughs> seems to be a concern. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it's pretty sure it's 18 inches. inches. It's, it's, it's five. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's going to be shallow. It'd be interesting to know how much nitrogen we're actually talking about. Yeah. How much right. atmospheric depth, because it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a per square foot, it's a very small amount. Yeah. The trouble with the harbor is it's huge, and the watershed is huge. So I can't I mean, imagine you can even measure per square foot. I, mean, I, I really feel uncomfortable making any preconditions without sort of knowing. Right. I think we should know. Exactly. Yeah. We exactly. would be dealing with at any given average year. There's got to be, a, there's a number out there. If, if there's a standard per square foot, I mean, obviously we can calculate. Right. I think mean, Cormac said there is, that there are several forms. Well, a little bit more. Yeah. Not for nothing, I think the other piece of information that goes with that is how the land is currently being managed. For what, you know, if there's a fertilizer program on that property, what that right. may be. Because mm -hmm. if that's turning into a different area, that's going to be a different kind of percent change as well. So that's. Right. This is not it's a luxury landscape. No, it, it's <laughs> not. But, no, but if you're fertilizing it at all, that's nitrogen you're not yeah. going to be applying. And, yeah. and, and my sure. guess is that it's maybe the first thing I've ever asked for a yeah. percent change in, in nitrogen inputs. Actually, I've got an interesting thing about tennis courts and clay. Clay is a great absorber of everything. I mean, it really is a great filter. I wonder how much. I bet the tennis court absorbs a ton of nitrogen and other chemicals. And then wood chips. Well, the, no, but it, it is. It has the cell structure of clay. Is it's got lots of open space in its structure. Boy, it just absorbs all sorts of nice. interesting things. Um, yes, I can see tennis. But, okay. So, um, would you like so that to? That clear as mud, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right. Do we have any more questions? Thoughts? Not at the moment. Okay. So, the right, so we'll continue for two, two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Oh, interesting. Yeah, right. Okay. Press for determination. Finch. Five Polywog on road. Tonight, um, with a request for determination of applicability 
uh, for work to occur within the buffer zone to a bordering vegetated wetland. The proposed work is to occur between the 50 and 100 foot buffer zones and involves abandoning a septic system and tying into the town sewer system. So um, uh, we believe that we would need to file a notice of intent. That's what we're here to, to ask. Um, there was some question in terms of um, the boundary determination and um, we would ask that this determination simply address um, that the work doesn't require the filing of a notice of intent and not get into whether the boundary might shift three feet one direction or, or the other in an extensive sort of investigation. It's, it's a tough area um, that's been maintained <coughs> over the years and depth of groundwater and so I think that um, you could spend a lot of money and time trying to determine the exact position of the boundary which really isn't the um, the root of the matter here, which is that we're trying to get rid of the septic and tie in, the, and we're certainly um, more than, no matter where that boundary ends up, we're, we're going to be more than 25 feet away with all work. So um, uh, with that, we would ask for a, uh, a determination that uh, the work doesn't require file notice of intent. We would uh, fill the septic tank in either with blowable fill or uh, crush the bottom, pump it empty, crush the bottom as required by Title V and fill it with clean compacted sand. Is, is this the only area that's in our the section from here to here is the only thing we have? Yeah, so you can see on the yeah. other plane where I yeah. highlighted the, um, oh, okay, the yeah. pink line, yeah. 100 is highlighted. Right, so most so of this yeah, that's, line is really that's it. So but that yeah. is where the essentially yeah. the existing septic system right. is completely within the 100 foot buffer zone. But outside the 50. But outside the 50, yeah. right. Well, this is a, seems like a, it seems like a we're talking about nitrogen, this is going to Get rid of a lot of nitrogen. Going yeah, this is the real positive. positive. Yeah. This is the real yeah, positive. So I think, uh, I, mean, I think from our end, I, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, what happens, we went out and I went out to do the, the site inspection and do some work on the wetland line, and Bruce had looked at it, and it, there's definitely some questions of, of, of hydric soils and where they position. I think it has zero impact on this project. Right. If mm -hmm. that line's going to move five feet, and frankly, if the line moved 15 feet, this project is still... Um, a plus. Uber beneficial. The yeah. farther so that line moves, the more beneficial this project it, is. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. um, to that end, I mean, I think our end, and, and, and I told Art that um, the boundary needed some refinement, I think, and, and some stuff for the record, but the work definitely qualifies as a, as a negative three that it doesn't require the notice. That's from my end. It's kind of junk to the chase. But, yeah. but we wouldn't do the. Uh, <coughs> the but there'd be no. recognize the wetland boundary. No, that's correct. Yeah, so, we would just be. be my recommendation would be just to issue as a negative three for the work in the buffer zone. Um, that doesn't require a notice. Mm -hmm. well, there's no other questions. I'll make that motion. Well, I'm just Does anyone from the public have a comment? Concern? Okay. So I will second that motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? I second it. Yes. Got it. Four, 40 Squam Road. some of the brush on the property uh, in order to assess what he's got a little better. It's pretty heavily vegetated and um, I think there'll be a future notice of intent for 
some work that has not yet been defined. Um, all, all of the proposed clearing is 38 feet away from the approved wetland boundary, so we satisfy the 50% no disturb requirement between the 50 and the 25 foot setbacks to the wetland. And the work has been approved by um, under a MESA permit. So um, aside from uh, brush cutting, there's there's no other proposal to do any other work. Just to add for the record too, they did ask for boundary confirmation as well. So mm -hmm. Bruce and I both reviewed it and we agreed that the boundary is, is accurate. Are they gonna remove the brush and replace it with lawn or are they just gonna cut it down and leave the leave the shrubs or whatever is there to regrow? Or? At this point, I, I think they just want to cut. They're not, there's been no discussion with me about cutting the lawn because, uh, especially down to the south, uh, that's the area where they might uh, place a cottage or maybe uh, a pool or some landscaping, but uh, no landscaping is proposed under this request. Or, I'm sorry, no lawn. So it wouldn't need no irrigation. No, no, no big trees coming out. I don't know that. Um, the brush is, in general, it's about this high. I don't think we're seeing much in the way of trees. The trees are more right up along the fringe of the road, and we're not we're not going to be clearing right up to the road. Um, I think any trees that are out there are mostly chalk cherries. There's no. Nice specimens like oak or peach or anything like that. Are you you're sure about that? I am. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one of the I've actually been to anymore. They don't let me go out anymore. No. <laughs> Your name's at the bottom. I'm all the associates. <laughs> you can go to whichever ones you want. So they take pictures for me. <laughs> Approved. Did you say Jeff? The wetland boundary was. The wetland boundary was. Okay. Yes, they do. We checked it again. I would say this is one of the rare cases that I, I think it can still be done as a negative three, but you may put a condition on there. This is what I was going to recommend that the brush cutting be done and, and no rubbing or no lawn is to be installed with vegetation below. Regrow. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of condition that it's cut for their planning purposes and then it would require a full filing to convert to a long yeah. or that's when, you, that's when you're gonna get into you start growing this and then you're gonna get into some yeah, yeah. still pitching you know game. Yeah. So I think okay. you, you would want to say that it'd be a negative three with you know no grubbing um, and the vegetation be allowed to, to regrow. Uh, any public comment on this one? Okay. So would someone like to make that recommendation? So okay. Do you have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. okay. Public meeting, certificates of compliance. Goose Cove LLC, 7 South Cambridge Street. This one was for uh, the upgrade of an existing septic system. Uh, this was converting a traditional septic system to an IA septic system uh, and installing water service to the building as well. Uh, we have our Board of Health sign off that it was done correctly um, and the septic as built is done in compliance with the plan that was submitted. Uh, so we are recommending the Okay. Someone like to make that recommendation? So <laughs> Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That one passes unanimously. Twenty three Commercial Wharf J A LLC twenty three Commercial Wharf. So this is one that uh 
We had originally permitted this back in, um, I apologize, back in 2013. Uh, the permit at this point has expired. Uh, and no work was done. They simply just want to close it out as no work was undertaken and just kind of get it off their, their title. So okay. it's invalidating it over a commission. Okay. Any motion? Sunset Realty Trust, 201 Eel Point Road. All right. Um, all right. There's a list of stuff for this one. Uh, this is one that was for the installation of a pool, retaining wall, a spa, um, construction of another structure. This is the one that also had the removing of a cesspool originally with the two, removal of a walkway then installation of an elevated walkway uh, in its place um, with grading and landscaping and all those fun things um, that go with it. Um, the project is complete and in our inspection it's in compliance um, and we didn't have any other conditions that we wanted to go forward uh, with the exception of number 19 that related to the discharge of the pool to be sure that the pool didn't get discharged into an area of jurisdiction. Second. 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 All those in favor? No. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Reskin, Reskin, 34 Codfish Park Road. Yeah, this is one that uh, got recorded that we messed up in the office. We had forgotten to note on the certificate of compliance that it's also included in the amended order of conditions. So we're asking to get it reissued to cover that as well. Because it gets recorded separately, and we had to reference it, so that was on our okay. motion to reissue. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So for those who just to quick memory jog, this is the one that started as the enforcement action and that we had essentially ordered the restoration of the 26,000 square feet um, that's out there. I have the plate if you want to see it. Um, so just to run through it really quick with everyone, uh, finding number two just clarifies that it is in response to an enforcement order. I'm trying to put those in on these cases just to make sure that that fact isn't lost. But and this was not part of um, any NHESP review? No. Mm -hmm. It's one of those weird things. Mm -hmm. um, so the size of the performance bond came up, didn't it? Oh, it's in there. We'll get to oh, it. Okay. I'll, I'll just run through them real quick. <laughs> okay. uh, so number 19 <laughs> is just that uh, <laughs> oh, any, uh, any excavated material or plant material um, is to be chipped and disposed of because there's a bunch of material that was getting cleaned up as part of this. I don't know what's in that, but that area of Pacamo has some fun things like bittersweet and things that are through there that I don't think we want to just dispose of normally. Mm -hmm. um, that's there. So number 19, so number 20 kind of starts the 
the restoration condition. So it's just that the report demonstrating percent cover of seeded areas and the condition of the planted trees and shrubs with photographs um, be provided at the beginning and the end of each growing season for three years. I took out the or until a certificate of compliance is issued. I think this is the minimum there, and we'll get to that again. Uh, from our discussion, 21, trees and shrubs shall be required to maintain a 95% survivorship. And then 22 is the other piece that goes with that, that the seeded areas shall have greater than 80% vegetative cover at all times. So once that seeds in, they have to maintain it as covered. Uh, 23 is our normal no cultivars. Uh, and then this is what Edith brought up, Ian, is this number 24. The applicant shall be required to file an estimate for all work, including monitoring and reporting requirements. That's something that we've missed before, that they always give us these estimates from the landscaper to do the work. Mm -hmm. And then the landscaper does it, and then they don't pay for someone to do the monitoring anymore. That lumping that in, so it may be two separate estimates. Um, the reporting plans with the commission in an escrow account performance bond or similar for that amount to be held by the commission until a certificate of compliance is issued. And then I have a, if the initial work is not completed within a timely manner, the commission may activate that account for a bond to complete the work. And then I have a number 25 that goes with that, that the initial restoration, planting, and seeding shall be completed of May 1st of 2017. I don't know if that actually had, if that was, I thought that was pretty fair to get all of it done and at least see what they're kind of getting in for the initial work. I wasn't pushing it too much, especially if they start now. Um, and then I have that they shall appear before the commission after June 1st and late fall to discuss the condition of the restoration areas so they physically have to be here. 27, invasive species are supposed to be removed as they find them. Uh, 28, it's something we've only been doing for coastal erosion projects, but I thought it was good in this case. Uh, the applicant shall file for a partial certificate of compliance upon the initial planting and seeding. Um, so we're going to get kind of an as-built plan that gets reviewed by everyone. We'll do a field viewing. We'll issue out that partial cert that that was complete, and that's our baseline for starting monitoring that everyone has agreed to and has seen. Mm -hmm. um, there's 29. Should the plantings not meet the survivorship standards, the commission may request a new filing or extension of the order of conditions to continue addressing the restoration of work needed to be completed. So at, at some point, we kind of reserve the right to say, you guys need to file again or do an extension. Um, the sill fence with hay bales is 30. Uh, this is one that we haven't done before either. 31, a monthly inspection shall be scheduled by the applicant with commission staff until all initial work is satisfactorily complete. <coughs> so that's them calling our office, scheduling a time that I meet them out there, and they physically walk me through it, because that way if there's issues, um, I can say it to their face and don't have to do emails or phone calls if they're stuck to it. Um, and then 32 is another one that came out of the meeting last time, that some sort of permanent markers shall be installed to mark the restoration areas as no disturbed areas. So they, rocks, fences, little lawn ornament guys, jockeys, whatever they want to put in that market that they know um, is something that's there. That was my notes that I wanted to get in. I mean, hopefully I didn't miss anything. I mean, very thorough. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm getting tired of Cormac calling me and harassing <laughs> about these restoration projects that we're missing things. And hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully this is going to start to be kind of what we look at for, especially in areas of enforcement, for these restoration things to go forward. Because, I mean, I think lessons learned from Hummet Pond Road and mm -hmm. then some of the order of conditions for, like, the Holly Farm restoration, um, some of the issues and things we've had, just trying to take any guesswork away from applicants or any open to interpretation things, but then also have something for you guys to use as a tool to say, it's not getting done. It's not getting done correctly. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. cashing in under your bond, and we're going to hire someone to go do it and oversee the work to make sure it gets done correctly and <laughs> it, it, it enjoy those things. So, I guess I have just one question. Sure. I have 25. Um, is everybody comfortable that May the 1st? I think it's going to depend a little bit on plant availability. Right. But let's hold them to May 1st. Right. 
I say let's start well, with May first. May can, can come in. And well, if we want, we could add a sentence to that that says this date can be extended um, by written request to the commission, and then you guys could discuss where they are and discuss the reasoning to it. My kind of thought is to leave that out. Yeah, yeah which they're, 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 they're getting really up against it. They can apply to amend. They'll have to right. That's yeah, I think that'll we'll play that. That's I don't have a lot of kindness involved with yeah, this. I, I would rather just, just keep them to it. Yeah. Something needs to be put in, and I don't know if this is covered under the invasive species because it's debat debatable, but the love grass that's being removed. Right, removed. Is so that? I, or that's that covered under excavated done, material. That would, that would cover under any excavated material okay. or right. plant written material removed from the site okay. um, mm -hmm. would be lumped into that. Okay. I mean, have they started up there yet? Yeah. Did they rub that out? Did, did they, they started, they, they cut it all out first, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they are in the process of removing it. Mm -hmm. So they've changed contractors off to doing that. So Mark Norris is doing the work for them now. So. I move to approve this presentation. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would I second yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Is that as amended with that sentence about the extension? No. No, no. just as drafted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, that's the motion. And we have a second? Second, yes. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes in the right. Good model for the future, too. Yeah. 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 Good stuff in there. <laughs> Keep that one. No, I, I, I think for a lot of these, obviously, the ones that, that are in areas of enforcement, things like the, the escrow and performance bonding may not be as critical. But I think as far as restoration work goes, more inspections from us and a little more oversight will keep people a little bit more honest and on task. And really, the thing with the, the escrow that I was really made sure I kept in there is the one complaint that I get back from uh, Guys like Brian and Art, they, just, they do the work and then they pay the bill and they don't call back for the follow up work. Yeah. But if we're not getting them, we can now say, oh, performance bond. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Brian's great. Yeah. Uh, it's based upon an estimate that, that they provide for all of the work. So they have to submit a physical estimate for the landscaping and then a physical estimate for the monitoring and recording. So the number that they hold in their performance bond has to cover that amount at a minimum for both of those components. Okay. Okay. So, 6 to Wall Street? So we just Wall Street. Street. Yeah, we're just going to discuss it. Not for, not for really not this one. We don't have to they didn't close it. They didn't close, close it. We don't have the number. The thing that you want to add to this, they said they were going to tie in the garage or cottage to the storm drain. Yeah. 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 Okay, I wasn't sure if you were going to discuss oh, anything about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Extensions of orders of conditions. 9 E Street, LLC, 9 E Street. Yes, this is one. It's a project that was approved in December of 2013 and is getting ready to expire. Um, and they've asked for um, <coughs> their three one-year extensions um, to allow them to complete the project that they have started.
enforcement action. All right. All right. So we did a field viewing at the one that we'll, we'll be talking about this evening on Monday that uh, Ernie Andy and Ben were at. And I have some pictures. Sorry, the first one is from really far away. My digital zoom is bad. Um, and I know I saw Rachel come in right here from the land bank. Um, the parcel adjacent to 175 Fultis Road that's owned by the land bank um, had what is pretty clearly to me a pretty significant uh, unauthorized brush cutting for view shed purposes uh, across land bank property to benefit a private piece of property without knowledge of the land bank or authorization from the land bank. Um, so I'll pass the pictures around and then I do need to put it back at some point. And then also, yep. So, and then I'll also pass around kind of an aerial that shows the lot in question in 2014. And you can see they've encroached with the lawn area. Uh, and then in 2016, when it was taken earlier before the cutting, uh, that was done. But it's essentially a brush cut across the land bank property with the vegetation that's about, that's on average two and a half feet to three feet high at the highest. Um, there's creek that runs through that section of property, and then it's within the buffer zone to the larger marsh section across the dirt road, um, but none of this had permits. Um, this was brought to our attention by the land bank doing the site inspection and doing some work. Um, I know Rachel had some comments that she wanted to add, but they have essentially requested that we issue this enforcement order um, to start addressing how it's going to get fixed. But I'll let you hop in here to your property. So. Issuing this to the land bank as a property owner, kind of inclined to issue one to the property owner at 175 Colpus Road as well. Um, at some point, knowing that it was knowing that it was them because the field spot doesn't make any sense. Don't have any means to prove that at this point, but I would love to. <laughs> perfect line from the yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I guess. Oh, we have who's been in contact with them. So, oh. Jeff, who do we we issue the enforcement action on the we'll, we'll land, issue bank it. land right? Yeah, yeah well, on the specific property mm -hmm. um, to the land bank. But I think what I would recommend would include what delineation first of 
of, of property lines, yeah. delineation of all resource area boundaries, um, and then a full restoration plan for that area to come in, mm -hmm. kind of similar to the Holly Farm. Um, I know there, there were some trees that were pruned. I didn't go through it enough to see if they cut down any. There were some pretty good-sized logs sitting on the ground. So yeah, you can see from so pictures. Yeah. Was, so can, can, we, can, we, can, we, can we issue an enforcement action on that property, to the property owner as well? I just, it just seems like we need some sort of, like, get their attention Correct. first. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I think we can, um, just based upon the fact that the lawn clearly belongs to them, that we could probably issue to both. Yeah. Um, do we know who the landscaper was? Or who no, at know. this point, no. Oh. We got contacted, what, Monday? Yeah. And then we went out that same day to go see it, and that was really the first time uh, we had seen it. So it's pretty new to everybody. I know you guys almost seemed like you guys got into it by doing an inspection on one of the other properties. So. Right. But and, uh, and it's just barely, it's really visible. The house is not at all visible from what was prior yeah. to this point. So there, there had to have been substantially large trees there. Based on what's on both sides of it, yeah, there were some there were some very nice yeah. junipers yeah. in there. So yeah. I, some very to me, nice I think we, we issue out trees. the enforcement yeah. order to, to both, um, say, 175 Pulpus Land Bank. Here's your enforcement action for, for both. This is what we expect, and I guess it's up to you guys to decide if you know a, a notice of intent with full restoration plan is required. Um, that delineates the property lines and the boundaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, part of it is I'm not sure how much of it is covered by buffer zone or not. I think 90% of it probably is from where it is, um, but yeah. it's hard to tell. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I would be more comfortable actually approaching the property owners to have them actually admit that they did it first. Before. That would seem to be your first step. I mean, we certainly can send them I think part of this that goes wrong with Austin, I think the land bank is requesting that they also have it put to them because of their discussions with the property owner that did the work. Yeah, I think they would like to have the leverage of mm -hmm. an enforcement action from the commission to discuss how they are going to be fixing it for their work. That was kind of the impression. Yeah, I mean, I we're doing. requesting it to be put on to us so that then we can turn around and um, address the homeowners right. in the area. Discuss what the ramifications are going to be for mm -hmm. doing work like this. Yeah. I think, I mean, just to, to throw out, I don't want to put words in the land banks or quick, I think part of it is also for them to have enough impetus that if they decided to take some sort of action legally against the property owner, that they would have a record built in advance that they were on good standing and being compliant with that. <coughs> yeah, I guess. What happens if they say that they have nothing to do with it? They very well might. But so like I said, the, the currently the land bank stand standpoint is that there's no legal <coughs> action taken. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone on that landscaping crew will admit oh. to working there that day. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't know, you know, when it comes to the legal, the legal approaches, I'm not sure. Well, I, I, I will say that, just, if everyone has a chance to go out there, if you take, go past the marsh and take, you see the little land bank post and take a right onto that road like you're heading to the land bank parking lot that's at 169 Corpus Road. Um, There's no other plausible explanation. Really yeah, it's yeah. I mean, to your point, you know, I was thinking the same thing, you know, if they right. say, well, prove it. Who knows? Yeah, prove it. <coughs> no, then where do you go? However, um, I think, well, just, I think that's you, you, you got to get, you got to get something in place. First of all, I, I, I would go with the full NLI re restoration plan, mm -hmm. <coughs> everything, and get this on record mm -hmm. so you guys have some. Regardless of who did it, that's what we would want because it's clearly in our buffer zone and it's it's a, just brutalized out there. I mean, it's. I'm not arguing with any of that. I just think, <laughs> you know, rather than throwing the book at them before you've even established they did it. I will throw the book at the land. Well, bank. we're asking you to throw the book at us and then we'll take. We will basically own it 
Use yeah, that so as the tool. Then we're going to deal with the it's power to hit us. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting situation. Mm -hmm. It's your land, so it's yeah. 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 This is that's a good point. I know it's not similar it in scale, land, but it's so very similar to the last portion that we issued to the land yeah. bank for the cutting on Hallowell Lane. Yeah. Where another property owner was using land bank land without authorization and doing work in the buffer zone, where the land bank has said, "Enough is enough. We need to." take quick action, and I think this is one where they're saying, please issue us an enforcement action, and then give us those requirements, and we'll take it from there, and however they parse it out with the with the abutter is going to be partially up to them. And I think the other thing, too, is at this point, um, it's visible enough that it's either us coming in and telling you about it, or you calling us in and telling us about it. Or, or so I'm going to be standing here no matter what, and it's either going to be that we're telling you that this happens, yeah. or you're going to be saying there's a wetland violation on your property, and you have an enforcement action. Mm -hmm. So, because it's that visible from Pulpus Road. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're driving down kind of northerly on Pulpus Road, you look that direction. You, you can't really miss it. Obvious. Yeah. Okay. So are you going to? Well, we'll just we'll sign it, and I will. It's our normal and a wildlife restoration plan. That's there, and I'll send it to the land bank. And, um, I think it'll also be right through corroborated. Yeah, maybe somebody out there saw it happening. Do we need a vote on this one? We'll ask you yes, you do. As it's being signed. Do we have a motion to motion issue the enforcement? Issue the enforcement. All those in favor? Second. Second. Aye. 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 Very good. We got it. Good luck. I think it's half <laughs> fine. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess not for other. I, I find it amazing that in a year that the land bank made it on the front page of the paper for yeah. right. a, a similar issue that someone actually had the nerve to do, do it literally across the street for the yeah. part from it again. But it's, it is what it is. Because they had no we'll other work see. to do. Sure, we can take I mean, a lot of these people, a lot of these homeowners, really, yeah, I think I was like a, either think or la la, and it's like, can we be able to get down to the road? I mean, <laughs> you know, who, who knows how that transpired, you know? Of but course. It's, uh, people do. The owner, no. Mm -hmm. Legal here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I put a peer in the middle. You can do that in mass. You can do that in mass. Yeah. yeah. It's not even that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
wetland habitat, we should just have a routinely start to find people for this kind of thing. Well, yeah, just to that is something that we talked about, and we just need to set a date for public hearing. Is we need to adopt a kind of what's in the shellfish regulations, the same kind of thing. We have to adopt set fines because the issue we run into right now is our bylaw allows us to find up to three hundred dollars per offense per day. But what happens is, and the the memo that we circulated a while ago from town council talked about it, is without clear clear guidelines for how that's determined, we end up having to default to the to the code of Nantucket again that we essentially could issue a fifty dollar penalty per offense. Don't get that much discretion. So we need to say something as simple that unpermitted cutting of a brush is a you know, three hundred dollar fine or you figure out some way to describe it. Something but like per square foot of cutting. <laughs> well, you'd have to define the terms. Well, I mean, if we're well, taking down some yeah. big trees, that's yeah. different than like you could yes, yeah, yeah. the tricky part with, with some of it is we'd have to to vet that out a little bit with town council. When you cross a certain threshold, you move into a criminal complaint from a non-criminal complaint. Well, trespassing, you know, like some of these things are. Well, getting up there. Yes, well, that is an issue. The trespass is an issue that the land bank can take up. But as far as setting, if we set it like. Illegal brush cutting is a three hundred dollars per square foot. We have to vet that because if you went through like thirty six Pacamo and you had twenty six thousand square feet that was cut, and you know you multiply that out and you're over you know, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Sweet, that sweet. Is, <laughs> is, Tell and love that. Well, <laughs> you get there, but you've crossed the threshold into a criminal complaint, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think I would not be able to issue that ticket. That has to come from. <laughs> Well, I think it's a salient but point because we, we have, have to figure that out. Yeah. We, we have homeowners who apparently have such a degree of wealth that really all the normal structures are fine. It's not even chunk change. So yeah. it seems to me that it is a discussion that you know, to use the threat of a fine up to a certain amount to actually get their attention. Yeah. Well, I think we just need to have some kind of categories. The categories can be broad. But the penalties have to be clear for what they are to deal with it. Something also, though, for the individuals doing the work. Yeah, the landscapers. Well, no, it's, we'd have to adapt that into our that, regulations. That's, so that okay. definitely you could say that the homeowner is fined at a certain rate, and the individuals that perform the work are. I think that's the front line, honestly. And I keep coming back to it, but there's got to be the, the landscape companies have to be held accountable for this on some level. Because they're the ones that are going to say, I'm not touching this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Like and some of it, too, is... $500 fine or something. Yeah. And, and some of it for other work that gets done. Like, the one that always still kind of eats at me is the the walls that were built on your point. And I know not... I think only <laughs> Ernie and Andy were on the commission. Ernie and was on. Yeah. But the walls at your point were, were built right. and we were ordered those hmm. removed. Is There's point? really only a handful of companies that could have installed... You know, telephone poles to the beach. There's not that many companies on Nantucket that can do a hundred of those in a reasonable amount of time. That you don't have any real recourse to say, "What do you guys think?" You know, yeah. You have a penalty too because it's your job as professionals to make sure that you have the permits before you go do the work, that's even right. if you're getting instructed. And right. that's something that we have to put in there as well. That if you were an individual who performed the work. That there's some sort of penalty. I mean, right. obviously, it's but it, as severe, but it, but in that particular instance, without naming names, you know, a penalty of ten would have to have been ten thousand dollars to get their attention. So I think we really should have a serious discussion with town council about how to structure it so that there are options available to us to seriously get people's attention. The other thing I'd like levels. to start doing too is as part of our our budget and enforcement actions is I would like to start putting all of our enforcement actions, even if I have to pay to do it, put them in the newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Names and addresses. Because it, it's a shameless. It, it's the thing. I mean to not to yeah. go back to the to the you know, point walls again is the one thing that one of the property owners More said fine. was, well whatever the fine is, honest to God said to me, if you're going to find me, if I pay double or triple, can I keep it? <laughs> 
And then he laid it on the front page of the paper, and he goes, I'll do whatever you guys ask, so don't put me on the front page of the paper again. That was what got him. And that's what forced them into it. The, the money, the money doesn't, doesn't matter it, to, some, yeah. to some degree, but the fact that he was on the front page of the paper with his name and address was enough that he, he didn't want to play anymore. So I think it's something that's important, especially when they're egregious, like, 36 Pokemon was really bad. It's a half acre that was cut. Um, this one is not as big by appearance. I haven't measured it, but you're still looking at you know a few thousand square feet of unpermitted cutting. That if people start to see that there's some public shaming that goes with it, I mean, I thought before I would love to do it. And Ben sits in, in these meetings. I would love to put you know whoever gets fertilizer violations in the paper too. I mean, mm -hmm. that's all of those things that kind of come together. That's well, people love that section. But <laughs> is, I mean, that's like, everyone, everyone reads the court report. Like, there, I, I think people would start paying attention to yeah. more well, mm -hmm. anyway, Because then they're going to watch those trucks when they see those companies. Yeah. And that's the thing. Is, I mean, it's, right. it, it's the same offenders in some cases. And it's just a matter of making it clear to everyone that they're not acceptable to use because they don't like this. New rules. So, mm -hmm. New rules. Yeah. But if we adopt that in our regulations that said all violations shall be, you know, publicly advertised, you, that's it. And that, does, then it has to go in. Does, yeah. does, so does that's at their expense. Mm -hmm. so. Does the fertilizer training, is that yearly or is that just like one time? Uh, it's once you're licensed, the, the way the statute for the Board of Health is set up is that you're good for three years. Well, it just seems like something to add to the training. I know it's not quite the same, but you well, got all those landscapers some, in front of you. There's been some talk that if the program gets revamped, that there's kind of continuing ed credits for yeah. the fertilizer. Part of that, I think it would be interesting to have a class that talks about your responsibilities to know before you go out to a site right. and work on it at all. Get a copy of the order of conditions or at least ask the question. Right. I don't think – I think there's probably a fair percentage of landscape companies that – know of the Conservation Commission, right. but they don't know what that means. I mean, I see it, not to pick on realtors, I see it a lot with realtors too, where they mm -hmm. they know of it, but they don't know what that means right. and the impacts to properties. I mean, then once you deal with your surveyor who's dealing with it directly, or sometimes your attorney, you get that, but it's the landscape community. I think there's a fair amount that yeah. it's paper that gets put in the mailbox for construction, right. and they don't, no one reads it. Right. So I I have a commissioner's comment. Sure. Which is, I was in Marine Home Center the other day, and for, it finally registered, but they only have Roundup um, and no rodeo. And so I brought it up with Bill. Well, you have rodeo, it's got to buy a five gallon jug. Yeah, you have to have a pesticide application. Which is weird, but so it is. Really? It's the, con it's the concentration. Because, you know, when I talked to him about the difference between the two, he said he was perfectly willing to read literature on it and, you know, buy it, have it available. But, I, of course, I didn't realize that that's the minimum amount. Of as far as I know, that's all we ever buy. I mean, you can go down and buy ready-mixed uh, Roundup and other things like um, Rush Be Gone, which is a blend of things. Right. But, yeah, to get rodeo, you buy a... You buy a five-gallon jug of 52% mm -hmm. by volume rodeo. Mm -hmm. They could sell, like, Burnout, which is a vinegar product, which would be another lesser weed killer, but it's still an alternative. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if they do or not, but I just, mm -hmm. it's sort of just taking the wind out of my sails. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess the, oh. the, the way to maybe reinvigorate that to some degree. I know we've talked about doing it a couple times and we're kind of statutorily bound for a little bit, but I wonder if that's something that going into 2017 is even if we did a every other month a workshop meeting where you could discuss herbicides and things and if the commission really wanted to start to adopt things, you know, best management practices for, for herbicide and things that are there that you could adopt in products that you'd say you can kind of vet out to some degree or it gives you something to go back to. It would be kind of complicated to do, but we could start addressing topics that are kind of germane to 
what we do here that we don't really cover. And that can maybe go into non-wetland areas as well. I mean, they're not jurisdictional things. They're recommendations or practices that are there, even if it's, you know, how to treat stormwater. Or I just feel like there's more that we could do outside of our jurisdiction by discussing it and saying these are our recommendations and if people want to use them, that's great, but you at least have to have them. And it may be stuff that gets generated from the Natural Resources Department that's adopted here, or you guys signed on to. That may be a possibility as well, but maybe worth the discussion. I know we have some regulations we want to talk about at some point too, but yeah. it's kind of a scheduled commitment to say, yeah. you know, once every two months we'll take an intern Wednesday to meet for two hours and talk about things that aren't filings. Because it's just it's just terrible to sit through two hours of filings and then try to have an actual productive discussion. Right. right. So yeah, we don't want to intermingle the two. Yeah. And the stuff for special meetings. So if that's something we're interested in, we can look at that. Because I we mocked up the schedule for next year, so there's some interesting gaps. They're pretty three week gaps to miss holidays, so we can sneak one in there. Administrator staff report. Pretty good. Good. We can have yours for six today. We have a motion to close the meeting. Adjourn or whatever. Adjourn. Close. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.